Hi, everyone. So something different today. We're sharing an episode of Work Life with Adam Grant. You've heard Adam hosting this show before. He's one of our four extraordinary curators at the Next Big Idea Club. And on his podcast, he goes inside the minds of truly unusual professionals to discover the science of making work not suck. And it goes beyond work too. Adam uses fascinating psychological insights to learn how we can create actual change in our lives. Here's an episode we thought you'd especially like, which explores the great or maybe not so great resignation. Over the past year, millions of people have been quitting their jobs. I'm 22 years old, and I just decided to quit my full-time job. Today is officially my last day at the toxic corporate job, and no one's even acknowledged that it's my last day. People weren't just quitting at record levels. They were celebrating and posting their exits for the whole world to see. This is me one hour before I quit my corporate job. I'm shaking. You can probably hear my heartbeat. Quitting videos were all over the internet. There were entire teams leaving at the same time, people dancing and popping champagne bottles, even some announcing their departures through the store intercom. Yeah, y'all. It's getting real out here. The Great Resignation has liberated some people from miserable jobs and abusive bosses. But for others, this whole movement has also had moments of the great regret. Video is for the people that the universe told you to quit your job and follow your passions. Um, Because I did it back in September and life was good for a good two months and then I literally lost everything that I had just worked for. Everything was hitting the fan. So let's talk about what you should consider before you leave and what managers should do to help you stay. I'm Adam Grant. And this is Work Life, my podcast with the TED Audio Collective. I'm an organizational psychologist. I study how to make work not suck, and I haven't quit yet. In this show, I take you inside the minds of fascinating people to rethink how we work, lead, and live. Today, the not-so-great resignation. When and how to quit your job, and how to build a workplace where people want to stay. Thanks to LinkedIn for sponsoring this episode. Quitting is hard, but we'll all do it at one point, or maybe many points. I was working at a lumber yard in high school and with my best friend, and he and I both wanted to take vacation at the same time, which wasn't allowed. And so we both went to our boss and said, we both need to take this vacation. And he told us neither of us could take it because we were in our busy season And both of us just looked at each other and we both quit at the same time. And that's always stood out to me (laughs) as something that I'm not proud of. Meet Anthony Klotz. His first time quitting wasn't the last time he regretted the way he handled it. I started my career working for a wonderful employer to me. And I felt really guilty when I went to resign. And so I gave three months of notice which is way too long for that context. And after about two weeks, my employees had moved on, my boss had moved on. And so there were a couple examples for me of where I really mismanaged the resignation process. As I reflected on my quitting experiences, I thought, yes, it was tough to make that decision to decide to quit, but it was even more difficult to figure out how to quit. Once you've made that decision to leave, there's no guidebook. And because it's secretive, there's a lot of people that you can't talk to about it. And I figured I can't be alone in that. And it turns out uh, I'm not. He definitely isn't. Anthony is now a management professor at Texas A&M, where he's a leading researcher on quitting. In early 2021, I got an email from a Bloomberg reporter asking if I could recommend an expert on how to quit a job without burning bridges. I immediately introduced her to Anthony. And in the interview, Anthony used a phrase that we've all heard a lot since then. I was sharing my research and mentioned that I think it's really valuable that she's doing this story because I think there's going to be a great resignation in the U.S. in the coming months. Yep. That's how Anthony coined the Great Resignation. And then it was only a few hours later that there were articles saying, professor's prediction goes viral, and uh, my life hasn't really been the same since. Did you know that you were coining it? 
Or was it just an afterthought? Absolutely not. It was a complete afterthought. And I have no idea why I said great. And I just said resignations because that's one of my areas of research. And so I think that initial article surfaced this conversation that lots of people wanted to have and talk about the ways that they changed a little bit psychologically or the ways that the pandemic affected them. The pandemic didn't create a new trend of quitting. It accelerated an existing trend. The Great Resignation isn't actually as big of an outlier as it sounds. But still, the numbers are substantial. In the U.S. in 2021, over 47 million people quit their jobs. That's a record. And it's happening in other countries, too. Over the past year, people early in their careers, teens and early 20s, have been leaving at the highest rates. And the industries with the most turnover have been retail and hospitality. And in the coming year, 41% of the global workforce is considering leaving. Of course, many people don't have the option of quitting or haven't found a new job to jump to yet. So they're dependent on the job they have to support themselves and their families. Of those who can afford to quit, some are leaving terrible working conditions, low wages, or bad managers. And many have gotten higher paying jobs. Plenty of people are leaving seemingly good jobs. I wanted to know why, and Anthony identified three factors. The first was burnout. Unprecedented high levels of burnout. Frontline workers were pushed past their limits. People working from home were drained from longer hours. Parents were struggling to juggle their responsibilities between home and work. And one of the cures for burnout is, is detaching from work. And some of us can easily detach from work and others are not. They're stuck. And the only way to detach is to quit your job and take a break or quit and switch to another job. A second factor was the fear of getting sick and dying. Something known as mortality salience. You know, when we're near death or illness, starting to have these positive and negative existential thoughts. Am I living the life I want to live? That seems unique to the pandemic. This just overall widespread jolt that individuals had that made them reflect on their life. I think there's a lower tolerance for jobs that don't bring people meaning. People's time is limited and valuable and that they want meaningful work. And a third factor was that many people got a taste of freedom through remote work and wanted more. The pandemic allowed people to work from home for 12 to 18 months, and it was tough. And there's some things we'll always miss about the office. But what you can't argue with is that remote work provides you with more autonomy than being in the office does. And so when it comes time to give back that autonomy that I've completely adjusted to, we tend to not want to do it. I imagine you have a lot of people coming out of the woodwork saying, Anthony, you gave me the freedom or the courage to, to leave my miserable job or my toxic boss. I'm always a little bit careful because, we, you know, resignations are at record levels, at least for as long as we've been keeping track of them. But resignations were pretty high in 2019 as well, going into the pandemic because the economy was so good. And so everybody who's resigning right now is like, yeah, I feel empowered and I'm a part of this great resignation. And I don't have the heart or the knowledge, right, to say most of you may have quit anyway, it, but there is like another 20 or 30 percent of you that are, that are part of this for sure. And feeling empowered to exit an awful work situation is a good thing. But before you decide to quit too, consider that some of the people who resigned last year have decided it was a mistake. In a recent survey, 7 out of 10 millennials and Gen Zs said they regretted quitting their jobs. Certainly, some percentage, probably a significant percentage of these individuals who are quitting will experience regret at different times because all of a sudden the things, the reasons that you're leaving sort of melt away once you resign. In a new study, psychologists investigated what happens to your well-being after you quit a job. They recruited thousands of people who voluntarily left their jobs for new ones and followed them for years. It was the longest study of its kind, and the outcomes were not good. Even though people left because they were dissatisfied, they actually became more dissatisfied in their new jobs for several years afterward. The grass often looks greener from afar, but not so much up close. So how do you know when it's actually time to go? 
If you have a depressing job or an abusive boss, and you can afford to leave, run for the hills. But if your work is bearable, it's harder to decide when to leave and how. Whatever job or industry you're in, evidence suggests that before you quit, it's worth considering three factors, voice, loyalty, and alternatives. The first question is voice. Do you have a say in improving your current situation? Companies are very keen to help employees job craft and turn the job they have into the job they want. Before leaving, if you're leaving because you don't like one thing in your job or you don't like 20% of your job, bring that 20% to your uh, boss or to your HR manager and say, is there a way that I can that I can improve this rather than going to another organization where you get rid of the 20% of your job that you don't like and you get over to that company and you're like, ah, they don't have that problem. They've just got these five other problems that I didn't consider. If voice doesn't improve your experience, the next question is loyalty. How much do you care about the organization's mission and the people? Is the purpose aligned with your core values? And are you committed to the colleagues you'd leave behind? If the answer is no, then it's time to consider the third question. Do you have compelling alternatives? Along with whatever is pushing you away from your current job, are there viable options you feel pulled toward? Are you drawn to a more interesting role, a great mentor, or a better learning culture? This past year, I've noticed some people not really considering their alternatives before just walking away. But Anthony pointed out that alternatives are more readily available now than they were before. There's a lot of opportunities to make some money online. And so I think what happened during the pandemic was it was this forced minimalization. A lot of the expenses that we had prior to the pandemic went away. And I think a lot of individuals are not bringing those expenses back into their life. And they're saying, I've got a little bit of money saved up for some period of time. And so I want to take a break because I'm burnt out or I want to pursue some other venture for a little while. And so it does feel like right now the bar for the attractiveness of the poll to get me to quit is a little bit lower than it used to be in the past. And that makes sense because there are far more options for how to make a living now than there have been probably ever. So you've evaluated voice, loyalty, and alternatives, and you've decided it's time to leave. How do you quit without burning bridges? Schools will want recommendation letters. Your next employer will probably call your last boss for a reference. And you might want to come back one day if what you thought was greener grass actually turned out to be astroturf. In his research, Anthony has found that when people are ready to quit, something in them shifts. And it's not always pretty. The organization is the party that has the power. We do not. The organization can let us go. We probably need that paycheck. And so we're used to being on the wrong end of the power structure there. As soon as you decide to quit, that power balance flips. And often when people get a surge of power, it reveals who they are. Sometimes not great things can happen. In recent years, some of these power surges have been recorded and posted online for millions to watch. From a TV anchor quitting on air, to a man bringing a marching band to play just as he tells his boss he's quitting. Anthony has discovered that if you felt mistreated at work, when the power surge happens, you might regret the way you resign. It's very much this exchange relationship comes into play at the very end, where you think, I've been treated unfairly by this organization, so this is my chance to try to even it up and maybe steal some copy paper on the way out. This is my chance to blast my boss on social media or to my coworkers and try to get even. I've seen a few resignation videos where I'm like, wow, that person's an asshole. I think what your research suggests is maybe that person worked for an asshole. That's exactly right. You have the upper hand, but you don't want to stoop to their level. And once you announce your resignation, the narrative is out of your hands. As soon as you let one person know, the text strings start pretty quickly. And so making sure that, that the message that you give is pretty clear, quickly delivered to the individuals that need to know 
directly from you and that the message is consistent as well. So I've talked to lots of individuals that say, how do I write a good resignation email? How do I write a good resignation text message? And my research suggests that those are typically construed by managers as very avoidant styles of resigning and can be pretty insulting to managers. And then you get your resignation started on the wrong foot. You'll just gain all the respect and positive momentum if you just have that face-to-face -face conversation right from the start. And of course, since we're in pandemic times, Zoom to Zoom, face-to-face -face is perfectly acceptable as well. What I think is tricky about that, Anthony, is in some ways it conflicts with your recommendation to control the message. Because I know if I sit down and craft my email, I'll say exactly what I want to say. It won't get misinterpreted or misremembered. And I also can manage my emotions carefully. Nobody's going to try to talk me into staying, right? Or start hurling expletives at me during the, the email conversation. How do you think about balancing those competing goals? add a whole lot of practice in. And you just threw out some scenarios that you definitely want to be prepared for. What happens if they make a counter offer? Being prepared for all the different reactions that your boss may have, from crying, to laughing and being happy about you leaving, to being really angry. And sometimes we think the most perfectly crafted messages they contain blind spots and they're not the most perfectly crafted messages. And all of a sudden you've got a resignation email out there that's being forwarded around the company with something that's been construed in a way that you didn't want it to and you can't take it back at that point. Recent research suggests that the phone might be optimal. It comes across as more authentic and effortful than an email or text, but shields you from leaking unwanted emotions through your facial expressions. Once you have a clear resignation message and delivery strategy, you have to consider what the best notice period is. This isn't just for you. It's for the people you care about, too. The question that I think you really want to ask yourself is, how do I resign in such a way that I minimize the disruption to the organization? Thinking about your coworkers, thinking about your boss, uh, any projects you need to wrap up and so forth, and factoring that into your notice period. I think you can think to yourself, What's the last note that I want to leave on in this organization? Now, if you're a leader, sure, it's nice if your employees leave nicely, but you might want them not to leave in the first place. What if we met the great resignation with something like a great affirmation? More on that after the break. Okay, this is gonna be a different kind of ad. I play a personal role in selecting the sponsors for this podcast because they all have interesting cultures of their own. Today, we're going inside the workplace at LinkedIn. Can we please talk for a minute about the outdated idea of what is and isn't professional? Meet Ellie Middleton. A few months ago, she wrote a LinkedIn post about all the things that don't make her any less professional. The fact that I'm young, bubbly and chatty, the fact that I post personal things on social media, the fact that I'm open about my mental health, the fact that I have tattoos and a nose ring, the fact that I'd rather wear ripped jeans than a suit, the fact that I enjoy letting my hair down on a weekend, and the fact that my posts are always laced with emojis. In recent LinkedIn surveys, 60% of working Americans say that what counts as professional has changed since the start of the pandemic. At work, many people have become more comfortable showing emotion, discussing their personal lives, and expressing themselves. If an employer is going to judge you on the clothes that you're wearing, or your tattoos, or your nose ring, or whatever it might be, then they're not the right employer for you. Here's how Ellie does showcase her professionalism. I love my job, and I put my all into my work. I'm passionate and let my sparkle shine through. I'm reliable and get my work done. I have big goals and I'm building a personal brand and I've built great relationships with my team and look forward to building them with clients. Welcome to the new era of professionalism. It's so great to have you here. Before becoming an active contributor on LinkedIn, Ellie had her doubts about the platform. My preconceptions of LinkedIn as a platform was that it was kind of very corporate and very like old idea of professional and full of people that knew exactly what they were talking about and were much further in their career than I was and almost felt that it wasn't a platform for someone like me. But I feel like 
kind of off the back of that post and the relationships that I've built and the people that I've connected with. It's an environment of positive people and people that want to better themselves and people that are ambitious. And I think as a creator, that's kind of like the best environment that you could put yourself in. You're kind of around people that want to better themselves and want to help you better yourself too. Um, so I think, yeah, it's definitely a more supportive environment than I expected. Around the world, people applauded her take on professionalism. They may have been wearing physical masks, but they were ready to take off their emotional masks. And being able to take off her mask had particular significance for Ellie. I'm newly diagnosed with ADHD and also found out that I'm autistic. It was a big light bulb moment for me. You know, masking is something that like autistic people specifically do to kind of fit into the world around them. But I think kind of like everybody has that certain level of mask showing up as their work self or being their professional self. I was so deeply unhappy, exhausted, and just using all of my energy in like wearing this mask. Why do we feel like we have to do that? Like everyone in the office is a person. So why can't they be that person rather than this character? A few days after her post took off, Ellie got a message from the founder of a marketing agency. He was like, I know that your inbox is going to be full of opportunities right now. So like I'll throw my hat into the ring too. It literally has changed my life. New job, I'm moving to a new city for my new job. Audience of people that are interested in what I have to say. Like it's all kind of stems back to that, that one post, which is crazy really. Ellie didn't just find an employer who supported her values. She started an important conversation that enabled other people to share their values. Ever since her LinkedIn post, people have been tagging her in their comments about professionalism very surreal again because I kind of had no audience beforehand suddenly like people are putting like inspired by Ellie Middleton and I'm like what how did I inspire you every day millions of people turn to LinkedIn to learn and talk about the things that matter in their lives driving meaningful conversations that lead to opportunity join the discussion on LinkedIn There was one day where three people quit on one day, which was probably the worst day of my career. This is Ursula. Ursula Leparoli. Like pepperoni, but with L. Ursula is a partner at KPMG in Australia. Back in 2017, one of her employees quit. Then a second left, and a third. And for the next year and a half, it kept happening. It was what I call a, a mass exodus in our team. So we, we had many people leaving, and I, I was co-leading the team at the time. And I was like, what are we going to do? You said mass exodus. Yeah. How mass was it? <laughs> oh, maybe half the team. Wasn't a pleasant time. What did people say about why they were leaving? We just started new processes, and we'd re done a restructure. So it was, it was a tumultuous period of time. So I think it was, you know, a lot of things kind of building up that, that led them to it. And then once your friend goes, it's, all right, well, maybe I should go. And then you start thinking about it. There's a name for that. Uh, it's called turnover contagion. Turnover contagion is very real. Great resignation expert Anthony Klotz again. Often when you decide to quit your job, your coworkers around you weren't thinking of leaving. But now all of a sudden, someone that they like is leaving and that makes their job a little bit less satisfying. Also, by you leaving, you may have just dumped more work on their plates. When someone leaves, it can also plant a seed in your mind and you start reconsidering your job and your loyalty to the organization. You know what's that saying your mother tells you if everyone jumped off the cliff with you? But I think if one person starts to go, then you're kind of like, well, what's on the other side of that cliff? <laughs> so I think it just makes it easier for people to think about it. What was the mood like as these people just all jumped ship? Not great. <laughs> I think from my perspective, as a leader, you feel like, oh, gosh, is it me? What's going on? Like, and you start doing a bit of soul searching. Ursula wanted a big change. We got to rebuild this and we got to build it better. So how are we going to go about that? During the mass exodus, she was doing exit interviews, but she realized she wasn't getting the full story. If your boss asks you why you're quitting and you've already decided that you're going to quit, you're probably not going to tell them everything anyway. You're going to hold a little bit back. So as a manager, how could Ursula turn things around when she didn't have all the pieces of the resignation puzzle? Were they overwhelmed by work? 
Do they lack trust or respect? What pushed them over the threshold? Let's be clear about something. The optimal turnover rate is not zero. Research reveals that when people leave, it can disrupt groupthink and open up access to fresh ideas. But too much turnover has a high price for organizations. It can erode productivity, creativity, community, and culture. Exit interviews can help you understand why people are leaving. But evidence shows that if you want to retain people, it's critical to check in with them before they've shown any indication that they're ready to quit. Ask people why they've decided to stick around and what would keep them in the future. That's called a stay interview. And the concept really just resonated with me. So Ursula started reaching out to some of the people who stayed. And I was curious as to why they stuck around. And you can spend a lot of time focused on the people who need a lot of help and are, you know, not pulling their weight. Or you can have a chat with the people who are are the strong performers and understand what's their magic. The goal of a stay interview is to show people that you're invested in them and learn what you can do to improve their jobs and the organization. Last year, one of Ursula's stay interviews was with a star performer who's been on her team for the past decade. My name's Rebecca Main, and I'm a senior consultant in Ursula's team um, in the global mobility space, assisting with preparing tax returns. Before her stay interview, Beck had seen two colleagues leave. Turnover contagion was in the air. It was stressful just because it was kind of like how much is going to be left on my shoulders to do. Um, And obviously difficult to sort of find new great people to fill their spaces. And so I think Ursula was definitely just sort of curious as to what makes me stick around and what I enjoy about my work, but also what areas I could sort of see some growth in the future. It was a really good sort of opportunity for me to give feedback sort of the other way and have that sort of open discussion. Why did you pick Rebecca to have a stay interview? I know that Beck will voice her opinion. So it's not like if I sat Beck down, she would only give me the lollipops and sunshine version of what's going on. I have a whole page of notes from the conversation. Oh, wow. You kept them? Yeah. (laughs) Amazing. you, you, You can't just have this conversation and then not do anything about it. Follow through matters. When people speak up with suggestions they're more likely to quit if managers aren't open to making changes. From the start, Ursula signaled openness. I put the invite in her calendar for just like a 30-minute catch-up. Set the scene in the invite to say this is nothing that you need to prepare for. Started with something like, you know, Beck, I'm going to ask you some questions today. I want you to be honest with what you're telling me. This is between me and you. Just letting her know that it's a safe space. And, and yeah, like, I just want to hear about what, what's in your head, what's going on with you. What was in your head when that happened, Beck? Were you suspicious? I don't think I was suspicious. I was definitely kind of prepared, but also unsure about how I could possibly prepare for a stay interview. I had no idea what kind of questions Ursula was going to ask me. Ursula started with some basic questions. What do you like least? I think I said that we get weekly statistics and occasionally you have a week full of meetings and don't make that deliverable. And sometimes that's a bit disheartening and that's sort of all that's being recognized about your job. So I think that it's very beneficial when we look at a whole overview of the team. And Ursula took notes. And a few weeks later, Ursula acted on those points. She started tracking progress on team goals rather than individual goals. That reduced pressure on weekly deliverables. But she didn't stop there. What do you like most? Can you tell me more about what keeps you here? One thing that I do like, obviously, the fact that our firm is such a multinational company and the fact that there are sort of potential opportunities working on sort of presentation skills and and the fact that I wanted to sort of go down that pathway. And later that same year... We got an opportunity to actually give a presentation to sort of another team. And I loved that sort of exposure. It was, it was not something that I'd done in my career yet. She wanted more of those kind of opportunities. Uh, we were talking about this. I said, oh, Beck's the one to pick. She wants to do more presentations and out-of-the-box experiences. Here you go. <laughs> Wait, are you saying that Beck got drafted for this, this conversation because of what she brought up in her stay interview? <laughs> like, okay. Podcast opportunity, I will go to the person on my team who wants to do more public speaking. 
<laughs> That's correct. <laughs> Beck also mentioned that she wanted to grow her leadership skills. And from that, I was then a buddy for one of our graduates. I got a promotion last year. Ursula sort of made sure that with that promotion, I did get some more opportunities to lead. Ursula, was there a question that was especially hard to ask? Oh, the last question, which I think Beck said was her favorite question, was which was, <laughs> what might tempt you to leave? What did you say, Beck? I think I basically said, you know, a big pay rise would definitely tempt me elsewhere. I don't think I would ever just sort of move to a competitor to do the same thing. It would definitely sort of have to be a big sort of career change. But I, I just appreciated the question because there was no sort of negative connotations. It's a tricky question to ask because you're kind of saying, like, Beck, you're a very loyal employee. What could I do to undermine that? <laughs> Even asking Beck to come on this interview and, and, and then telling people what would tempt her away makes me uncomfortable. But I think if you shy away from the difficult conversation and the difficult questions, then you kind of missed an opportunity. My first thought when you gave that question as an example was, oh, I don't know if I want to plant that seed and mm. get you thinking about what would motivate you to leave. And then the more I thought about it, the more I realized, but even if that seed is planted, you've also communicated something much more important, which is I care enough to ask that question. I care enough to try to find that out and prevent it from happening. No, definitely. I mean, Ursula, I think after my sort of response to that, she was basically like, if you ever do sort of have an idea that you want a career change or anything like that, I would really appreciate if you spoke to me before because, you know, KPMG is such a large firm. You know, if you do want to try something else out, um, I'm sure that we could find that kind of opportunity for you within the firm. Extensive research suggests that people are more likely to stay when they're embedded in their jobs. That means their work aligns with their values and goals. They feel a sense of belonging with their colleagues, and they would have to make real sacrifices to leave. But few people will stay forever. And Anthony Klotz believes that if you really love them, you should let them go with great affirmation. So when it comes to letting employees go, why not celebrate them on the way out? Why not get in touch with them a month later? Employees after they leave may feel a little lost and they may feel regret. That's a great time to touch base with them. Or even go a step further than affirmation and offer departing employees a way to explore something else without really leaving. Why not give your top performer a one-year leave of absence? So all your benefits and everything stay in place, and we'll check in with you every three months or so and keep that door open instead of seeing it as a sign of disloyalty. So really encouraging quick boomeranging back, if you will. Ooh, I like this. So it's like offering an unpaid sabbatical as a retention device. Yeah, that's a perfect way to put it. Some of the ways that organizations and organizational leaders view resignations is changing over time. 20 or 30 years ago, it was if you resigned, it was almost always seen as some sort of betrayal. And increasingly, organizations are starting to view resignations more favorably and realizing, oh, this isn't a disloyal person who's leaving. If you treat people well on the way out, they're more likely to come back. And boomerang employees can outperform outside hires, at least initially, especially in jobs that demand a lot of coordination. Boomerang employment has been increasing even before the pandemic. And so it stands to reason that with the wave of resignations we're seeing right now, individuals perhaps just needing a small break from the workplace, uh, individuals wanting to try out an entrepreneurial venture, that in the next two to five years, we'll probably see even a bigger wave of boomerang employment. And I think it's important to realize that boomerang employment is a situation that can often be a huge win for the employee and an even bigger win for the organization. And sometimes it's a safety net for people who start to regret leaving, which Ursula has seen firsthand. We actually did have someone boomerang back. Uh, he left and he called me a week later and asked for his job back. And I said, welcome, come on down. Your seat's still waiting. <laughs> so I think people were shocked and thought, Gosh, that was quick. I think we'd, we'd purchased him a really nice departure gift from our, we collected <laughs> funds and gave him a really nice bag. Did he give it back? There were some jokes about that. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> what do you say to managers who consider that disloyal? 
who say, if you left, you can't come back. You know, realize that we're all human. You, you make decisions, sometimes you need to reverse out of that decision. We don't know yet how long the Great Resignation will last and how many people will reverse out of it. What we do know is that we're all drawn to joining and to staying in places where work doesn't come at the expense of life. It does seem like a lot of individuals have have really thought about how big and central work is to their life. And this is going to be probably a little bit too optimistic, but it does seem that most of us can agree that we're tired of hustle culture and would like to see that go away, that we're not impressed by how long you've worked or how many weekends you put in and those sorts of things. Gosh, I hope we're at a moment now where that can quit being cool to talk about. If that happens, we have a better shot at landing in jobs that enrich our lives instead of interfering with them. And instead of rejoicing to leave, more of us might even start celebrating our decisions to stay. Next week on Work Life. The benefits were that individuals were better able to get their work done. The team was more effective at working together and it was the first on-time launch in the division's history. Flexibility at work is much more than just letting people work from home. Work Life is hosted by me, Adam Grant. The show is produced by Ted with Transmitter Media. Our team includes Colin Helms, Greta Cohn, Dan O'Donnell, Joanne DeLuna, Grace Rubenstein, Michelle Quint, Ben Ben Chang, and Anna Phelan. This episode was produced by Constanza Gallardo. Our show is mixed by Rick Kwan. Our fact checker is Miri Jesu Tassim. Original music by Hansdale Sue and Allison Layton Brown. Ad stories produced by Pineapple Street Studios. Special thanks to our sponsors LinkedIn, Morgan Stanley, ServiceNow, and UKG. For their research, gratitude to Micah Sons and Cornelia Neeson on voluntary turnover. Albert Hirschman, as well as Michael Withy and William Cooper on exit voice and loyalty. Roger Griffith and colleagues on turnover. Andrew Brodsky on phone as an optimal method. Julie Hancock, Taeyun Park, and their colleagues on optimal turnover. Elizabeth McLean, Ethan Burris, and Jim Dieter on manager openness. Terry Mitchell and colleagues on job embeddedness. And J.R. Keller and colleagues on boomerangs. And thanks to Julie Martinez, Yamani Williams, Marissa Mays, Conlin James, and Damani Karu for sharing their quitting videos with us. I think that you're an excellent baker. That's fair. I like cooking. So Beck makes these little dates. Yeah, they're dates filled with peanuts um, covered in chocolate, like a healthy Snickers. It sounds disgusting, but only because I hate chocolate. (laughs) (laughs) Who hates chocolate? Yeah, it runs in the family.